What happens when a chiropractic sports physician and an orthopedic surgeon walk into a bar? We're about to find out. Jaron Sullivan is at the bar, my man. What is up? Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Man, thanks so much for coming. I want to start out with what are you having to drink tonight? So I've got an infused bourbon. Uh, pretty simple. Nothing added. <laughs> Straightforward. Tastes good. Brother, hard to beat. I drew the short straw. I have a lemon drop team provided. And uh, what I have to say about this so far is I had a couple sips a, a minute ago, as you know, and uh, it's going to be a struggle. It is tart. It is. It just takes all the saliva right out of your mouth. I, we're going to make it work, but it is definitely not on uh, my top 100 list instantly. <laughs> they might be playing a joke on you tonight. <laughs> yeah, and I think I'm losing hard. Man, tell me a little bit about the charity that we are toasting to tonight while having our lemon drop and neat bourbon. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to support lo uh, local youth athletics, so I uh, donated to the Youth Athletics Booster Club in Hendersonville, uh, which is basically a charity organization that uh, provides financial means to help athletes uh, uh, pay for things, pay for athletics that they're not able to otherwise. So that's awesome, brother. I love it. And I think that's something that uh, needs more attention and more light, especially in times where uh, individuals need that support and a great option to be able to, to bring that. So great choice. We also have a video plan right now that shows you how to go on that website and to donate. Um, thank you so much for bringing up that charity and bringing some awareness there. I did not realize how many cases over the last several years that, that we've shared or, or met at different points in the timeline. As soon as we announced that this show was going to happen, we had about 20 different people reach out instantly and say, that's my surgeon and give me uh, some incredible uh, just anecdotes. And I just want to be able to say that, you know, there something that I do, would like your opinion on as well is that, you know, we, we do a lot of post-operative rehab and something that we've always just been so impressed by with cases that you've uh, been able to work with either A, they've been a case where I'm thinking of one very specifically that had been turned down by about four or five different surgeons because of the high risk nature, uh, but you were able to help them with a, a really, really tough fracture. But there was also um, uh, several cases where we would get them in for a typical uh, supraspinatus repair or debridement and just how quickly we could get them back versus a lot of other cases has always been something that we've always been incredibly impressed with. Um, is that something that um, that you hear frequently or, or commonly that certain surgeons, certain skill sets are just, um, there's just different outcomes based on certain cases? Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting you brought that up. I, when I was in fellowship, uh, fellowship, I had, uh, noticed like similar patterns, um, with, with different surgeons that I worked with. And one of the, one of my mentors, who's probably one of the fathers of, of sports medicine, Russ Warren, you know, he, he always really advocated like patient indications, the indications for surgery are so important. And, you know, now more than ever, we've got all of these imaging studies that can come up with you know, tears where we previously wouldn't have been able to see them and problems, uh, you know, that may or may not be there. Uh, but indications like choosing who to operate on is so important. And that's something that was really driven home to me when, when I went through my training. And I think choosing the right patients is really important. And then the second thing is doing the right procedure, doing it right, making sure things are anatomic. Um, and, and that makes a huge difference in how people recover you know, it's one of those humbling things as a practitioner. You know, I've been here at Vandy for six years, and right as I got here, I thought I was amazing. But my patients do way better now than you know my first year of practice, and it's a, it's a humbling thing. But um, you know, you definitely see as you get more reps and and your skill levels improve, like the patients do significantly better. And I, I enjoy my clinic a lot more now than I did probably six years ago, just because people do well. But thank That's you for awesome. bringing that up. 
Yeah, just to summarize what you said, so patient selection, a very crucial aspect in the surgical process, but also when you're there doing a really great job. We have uh, two other physicians in our, in our clinic that are big into the rehab side of things. And, and that's what we focus on so much in getting the patients better at, from the conservative approach. And we were having a conversation about it. And I said, I don't really have a, the best way to describe this, but we know when Jerry sees a case, I've never sat in on a surgery with him, but it's almost like he's just taken a little bit extra time doing just the minimal necessary to get a great job, great repair. And it's just, it's went really well. So I really appreciate um, your contribution to the Nashville uh, sports medicine team. And I really appreciate just uh, your great work over the last uh, six years and many more to come. Here's a lemon drop. <laughs> well, th thank you for saying that. I, I think the flip side of it is I love sending patients to you all because they do really well. And the amount of like uh, the meticulous effort that you all put into helping patients get better, because it, it, it's such a team approach. Like I do have, and I tell patients, Hey, if we decide to get in on this together, like I can fix this aspect of your problem, but you got to give me a 50, 50 effort. And the other part of that effort is doing the right rehab, making the effort to get better. And what you all do is uh, like, likewise, like when I send patients to you, I feel a lot more confident than, than most of the other places, just because I know patients are going to do well. So thanks That's for awesome, uh, contributing to that. Man, I appreciate that. I really liked what you talked about with the patient selection. And I think that's really important clinically because what I really want to talk about today where I really want to get more of your expertise is when we talk about shoulder pain. And with shoulder pain, we really have two camps, how we typically define it, is that we have our traumatic cases of shoulder pain and then we have our non-traumatic cases. So they're not sure what happened, but over time, just started to bug them, got worse and worse. And at that pivotal point, it seems where, depending on what office you're in, you may get a completely different type of care or approach. And even though more scientific evidence keeps coming out, I think it's important that, you know, it's us as, as clinicians are to do the best job we can to help educate the population, especially our community, because so often uh, the first thing that people hear when they say, oh, you got a little shoulder pain is, oh man, you're going to have to have rotator cuff surgery. That comes up all the time. And a lot of people understand a little bit because they've had a loved one or someone have a shoulder injury. But can you explain what the rotator cuff is for the listeners that maybe haven't heard a little bit of that detail? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the rotator cuff, on its basic level is what is going to stabilize the glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is your shoulder joint, the ball in the socket. And for shoulders, we have great range of motion, which allows us to throw, gives us, you know, makes us really functional. But the motion that we have makes our shoulder relatively unstable. And the primary goal of the rotator cuff is a stabilizer. It keeps the ball centered on the socket. So if the rotator cuff is functional and working well, then the ball pistons on the socket and everything functions fine. If you get a tear or tendinopathy or, you know, tendinitis, you know, if, if there's any pathology in the how the rotator cuff is functioning, then you, your shoulders start shifting around a little bit and that pinches things that cause a lot more pain. And it's like a downward cycle where, you know, one, you know, you bite your cheek and then you keep biting it over and over again. Same thing is happening with your shoulder. It just starts getting irritated and more and more irritated. I think that's a great explanation. And where I think what you did so well there to describe to just make that so simple is that when we get to the basic levels, we basically have these deep muscles to the shoulder that really have a couple of different functions. But the big one is obviously that stability piece. We want to be able to keep that shoulder uh, in the socket, so to speak, in that good pivoting position. So we're not getting that more uh, over irritation repeatedly over time to cause issues. When someone does have a shoulder pain that didn't start from a specific trauma. They were doing really well and they just noticed over time, maybe they feel like they slept funny, things started to show up. And then over time, they tried to put it off, put it off, and then all of a sudden it's driving them crazy. This is a, a predicament in our healthcare system, right? So I have a pretty big bias on how I think that should go at that moment. But really, it's us as an entire healthcare system have probably not done the best job on educating exactly what should be your first line of defense or your right decision. So all the time, Someone will end up directly to a surgeon the first time they've ever had shoulder pain in their life. And then at that moment, depending on what 
part of the country they're in or what provider they see, it may go completely differently. And so I would love for you to talk a little bit about as someone comes in and maybe just clear up some misconceptions about what when you do have shoulder pain and it's not from trauma, if we do get a scan right away, we're in clinic for the first time, what are some ways that that can go historically versus maybe how we want to see that go? Okay, so yeah, th- and this is a perfect scenario because I see this in the office every single day. Um, but I, I really like to go take a few steps back and say, okay, did I recall like a specific injury? And, and in your mind, if you didn't recall a specific injury, if you don't recall you know, a time when you lifted the trash up and you felt something tear, you, didn't, you, you had a fall and you felt something tear, if you didn't have a specific injury, the likelihood that something is just ripped apart is a lot lower. And the likelihood that you can make a big improvement with uh, therapy, with activity modification is really high. So, um, you know, if, if there isn't a trauma, your first line should not be an MRI. It should be seeing someone that is a shoulder specialist that specializes in non-operative management. And that's going to be trying to rehab it and get it back in shape. And, and the likelihood that you can do that is really high um, if you didn't have like a major event that, that came up. So I think let's that the, go ahead. Go ahead. So the, so the flip side of that scenario. So let's say you go in, you know, most of us don't just go into the doctor right away. Like we, we're, we're hurting for a while and we get to the point that's like, hey, this is not getting better, like something and then you talk to all your friends and I'm like, wow, you're having trouble raising your arm up. Like, that sounds like a rotator cuff tear. You know, you need to get that checked out. That's what was going on with me. And then, you know, before you know it, you're like, yeah, you know, I've been dealing with this for six weeks and I can't raise my arm. It's always hurting. Like, I think I probably do have a rotator cuff tear. So they go into their office and, you know, they, they see a provider and say, hey, I can't raise my arm. It's really painful. It's weak. Like, I think I have a rotator cuff tear. And I'm so done with dealing with this. I just want to get it fixed. And they, they, you know, the provider might say, well, we could try therapy. Look, is that going to fix a tear? You know, well, no, it won't fix the tear. Then I just want to get it fixed. And so why don't we do something? And I feel a lot of pressure from patients constantly like, hey, like, I really want to get that MRI. Then I know at least if I have a tear or not. Um, So that that scenario, like they ended up getting getting an MRI, it shows a tear, and they get surgery, and they don't get better. <laughs> you know, they still have persistent pain. And I think that's your classic example of like the wrong indications, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, and, and we can explain that a little bit more, you know, it, as we go on, uh, or, or whenever, but um, the, the point is, like, if you, ha- if you didn't have a trauma, whatever's going on in your shoulder, is kind of like the natural history of your shoulder. It's it's probably where it's meant to be if there wasn't a big precipitating event. And the possibility of getting it feeling better is very high with the non-operative modalities. So when you push for, you know, trying to get an MRI to uh, figure out what's going on to see if there's a tear, sometimes that ends up kind of pushing you down a pathway of surgery that may not actually help you. Yeah, I think that's really great. Let's talk through that a little bit more. So one of the hardest parts is exactly like you said, when a patient comes in, they're emotionally already over it. So they're not necessarily looking at it from the objective standpoint. They're saying, I'm over it. It's done. Like whatever we got to do, do it. And I think the hard part is, is when someone accidentally attaches in their mind finality to having a procedure and not understanding that's the beginning. I think that is the hardest part that we see all the time is when we screen for that right away is find out emotionally where are you sitting, right? Because if that's not well, we're gonna have to cross that bridge or this could get ugly fast if you're pushing a timeline. And that's where showing them the normative data on what a recovery takes is so dadgum important. And I think that um, I do wanna go into that a little bit more. Uh, We had a couple of big comments come in and questions I think will go really well into our discussion here in just a minute. Uh, Alan Bickmer said he's refilling his glass and wanted to say hey. Um, I I think the, the big 
transition is that's really important is that moment when a patient does come in, they're pushing for that procedure. They're pushing for, hey, I'm over it. I want it gone now. I want it fixed. I think this is where it gets really challenging. And I can't wait to talk to you more over a lemon drop um, about how, (laughs) how that goes. So if someone rolls into your clinic and you know that, hey, First line of defense here, you are a good candidate for rehab. And I feel like that's that's something that you just explained. That's half of our guidelines, right? What you just explained, meaning there, there was no moment that occurred where there was a tear, right? And emotionally, they may sit different places because shoulder pain sucks. I mean, we, we have good evidence that on functional MRI, our emotional center and our shoulder, they, they light up pretty similar areas. Like it's easy to be over it really fast. Um, but when someone does need that therapy or that moment to step back and do rehab, How? what are some tips or, or advice that you could give them? Or maybe even just when they come into the clinic, what typically is that conversation going to look like to them when they're trying to, to force the hand, give me the image, because they think that, hey, if I get this image, oh, I'm just going to feel so much better. But now they see a 40% tear, but they're 60 years old. And the stats are they're well within the range that, that that's pretty normal. W- what goes through yeah. your head? So I, I think first off, you know, the important thing I try to explain is that you, um, whether or not there's a tear is not all that relevant. What's relevant is what you're feeling and the symptoms you're having. And, um, you know, so much we get, uh, the, our brains are wired this way. We want to find a problem and we want to fix it. The, the problem that comes up is if we get fixed on a problem that isn't really the problem. So, you know, for example, as we age, we naturally get rotator cuff tears and they aren't necessarily symptomatic. So if you screen people in their 60s and their 70s, um, you know, off the street without any shoulder pain, you will find a high percentage of rotator cuff tears. And they have and they have no clue about that. And, you know, as you get younger, 50s, 40s, there's going to be lower percentages, but they're still going to be there. People that don't have symptoms and they have rotator cuff tears. So. You know, the first thing is like, you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, if you work in construction and you see a nail, you want to hit it like that, that goes for the surgeon. Like if you see a cuff, you want to fix it wrong. You got to take a step back and say, what, what's going on? Why do they have this tear? Is it natural? Is it part of their like natural history and just their, their wear and tear, you know, that they're experiencing? Or um, is it something that we need to address? And the same thing from the patient perspective, like, okay, you may have had this tear for a long time and didn't have symptoms. So what if we did some other modalities and got you to pain relief without having to go through a six month recovery on a rotator cuff that that may not help you anyway? Um, and And then the last thing is if it is a natural, like a degenerative tear, let's say, that cuff, like I can put it back, it's gonna re tear. Like, putting it, if it's naturally going to tear, you know, you can't put back bad tissue. So like it, it, it's, uh, you're just better, you're better off trying to, uh, work with your symptoms and work around it rather than trying to, uh, uh, fix a problem. That's the wrong problem to fix. And so, you know, and part of this comes up, you know, my, one of my colleagues, uh, Jed Kuhn here, here at Vanderbilt has done a ton of work on rotator cuff pathology and is, is really one of the experts on that. And there's some interesting things that he's found out in his studies. And one, one, as well as like the, you know, many of my colleagues, but one is that when people get a rotator cuff repair, a lot of times if you scan them down the road, they'll have a tear at subsequent scans, but they won't have any symptoms. So then it's like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Like if we fixed it but and now they're better, but yet the tear's still there or the tear came back like why why are they better and you got to say well maybe it's the rehab not the surgery and then um uh, another interesting thing was in a study that he did on degenerative tears like the number one factor for whether people did well with therapy or not was whether they wanted to do therapy so you know you gotta you gotta it's it's not just like oh if you believe it it happens but it's if you go into something thinking it's not gonna work you know, it, it's, it's not going to work. You know, I'm, I'm super into extreme sports. Like I love snowboarding, wakeboarding. It's a hundred percent commitment. Like you don't go try a backflip or a 540 or whatever. You don't try it unless you're a hundred percent in because you're going to fall short. <laughs> like it happens every time. So, so the same thing with therapy, like 
if you go into it kind of like, man, this hurts. This is a waste of my time. Like, I just want to get it fixed. Then it's it, the likelihood of it actually helping is pretty low. So, you know, their study, the number one thing about people that did well with therapy was if they wanted to do therapy. And I think that's a good take home message. Like, you got to be all in. You got to be 100 percent committed. And then you're much more likely to have a good result. Brother, you're on it. A lot of the research that we look at, and I help teach conservative rehab of the shoulder around the country. And one of the big things that I think that is so important that the evidence keeps showing us is exactly what you just said. It's that they have to be all bought in. But now I think what's really important here is that we have to remember that the provider side and the rehab side from the clinician that's doing it, a lot of that's on them. And I, I tell our whole team, we have that conversation. We all know it's on us because what is so important, if they have that moment, if they are that that person that's like, man, I, I just don't want to do this. This isn't going to work. I don't even know why I'm here. One of the coolest things that we see in our side of things on the rehab side is when we do some of these tests that we have, it's a battery of tests that are all just supporting the rotator cuff. So we're adding stability to it and see if it modifies their pain. So basically say they have pain reaching overhead. We're going to add some assistance there. And if it takes away their pain, then we see compliance go through the roof because we call that an expectation violation. They expect it's still going to hurt. We added our hands or cued their rotator cuff in just a couple of ways and they go, oh my gosh, I just did that and it didn't hurt. Those cases are so important. If, if you have someone that you're, wor that you're working with in the healthcare world and they haven't shown you like, here's our path to get better conservatively you're going to be out. I mean, if they just come in and say, hey, here's this cool thing. We call it Thrower's 10 and I want you to do this every day. I can just tell you that person's going to be out of there in no time and feel like, what the heck am I even doing? But I think the explanation from the clinician side is so important to from the rehab side as well to be able to educate them on on that rotator cuff tear. And a way that we use, because sometimes I think that communication is important. We get so nerdy about it that that just doesn't go well when we're explaining. Like if I go to the mechanic and they and they tell me that my, you know, my exhaust bumper is leaking, I'm like, I okay, like that sucks. I have no idea what that means. So I'm instantly checked out and not feeling good about it. But I think we have to uh, translate that message in a way that does make a lot of sense to the patient so that they understand what's happening. So one of the things that we try to do so well is when we are communicating with them, we first do our test to see if we can take their pain away with our movements. And the way we explain that really in two ways when it works well, the first one is, is yeah, if you can't lift 50 pounds, but you can lift 10 pounds pain-free, what's the typical path to get there? Well, you start with 10, then you get to 11, and then the next step in front of that's 12, and then all of a sudden we get to 50. But if you expect to go from 10 to 50, that's just, that's a poor mental state. And the other piece that we let them know is that the cool thing, like when we put a diagnostic ultrasound on it, and maybe we do see that little bit of a tear, but to be able to educate them, a lot of times we can strengthen that tissue and healthy that tissue better. It's almost like not 100%, but it's a lot like the kidneys. It, like in a healthy individual, if we remove a kidney and a heck of a lot of time, they're going to do really well and it's going to adapt and get stronger is that we see the rest of the backside of that rotator cuff really start to pick up the slack with our therapy for the area that is torn. And that's what is a really important message that us as providers should be able to help them with. And I think that's a missing link that we see a lot of times in healthcare that makes it really challenging on the average individual. Um, and I think you highlighted a, a big thing in healthcare there, brother. And so I didn't mean to tangent on that, but that is something I'm, I'm extremely passionate about. No, I, I love what you said because uh, I can't tell you how many times that I'll, I'll spend a significant amount of time with a patient, you know, 30, 45 minutes an hour, helping them understand why they don't need surgery on a rotator cuff. And then I send them to a therapy office and they come back two weeks later and the therapist has told them like, yeah, you need surgery. Like, I, I can't help you. Like, the, you've got a tear. It's got to be fixed. When, when I know that, hey, this is something that can be rehab. So it is like such a team approach and it does take every provider um, uh, and it takes a lot of expertise on each side in order to get somebody where they want to be. And, and when you really sit down and talk with patients and listen to them, and I think that's the most important thing is like uh, too often like we come in and we want to just like, okay, this, 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 th you know, this is the plan. This is how you fix it and then go to the next patient. But when you sit down and listen to them, then you you hear what's going on. And people, 
want to get it fixed. They don't really want surgery, <laughs> but they think that that's their best option because of their experience and because of what they've been told or what they understand. But if you really listen to them, they'll say like, yeah, I, it's not that I want surgery, but they're just, their understanding is they have to get surgery in order to get better. And so it does take like a, it takes the same message coming from every side in order to help them understand that, Hey, yeah, this is possible. And this is going to happen. Yeah. I think that's great, brother. I think we talked so good about that, that triage and that step and the teamwork. So to summarize, number one, most important thing, providers need to be patient. So if you're choosing a provider and you don't feel like that they're patient with you and doing a thorough analysis of what's going on and understanding the situation, you know, be on the lookout, but same on the other side, also be able to have some grace, give yourself some grace to understand it's going to take a little bit of time and to put in the work and have the right mindset that if your providers have said that this is a non-surgical case, then you should give it the good college try, work hard at it, and then let's see where that that gets to. Uh, someone asked a question. Talk to me a little bit about uh, an injection. What are times where an injection in the shoulder can be a good decision, and when are some times where that's maybe not the right decision for a rotator cuff injury? So um, I think injections kind of uh, can have a bad rap because a lot of times – you know, as orthopedic surgeons, like we get the reputation of just throwing an injection at everything that comes in the office. And that's definitely not appropriate. Um, in injections should be used to help decrease inflammation. Inflation injections can be helped or, or can be used to help for pain management if it's the right type of problem. So let's take the scenario of someone with a degenerative tear and a lot of pain. And then when you do the exam, they, they have a lot of inflammation. They have bursitis, they have impingement symptoms, you know, that patient, you know, they say, Hey, look, I, I can't do therapy. I'm hurting, you know, so bad. Like I, I really am having trouble putting any effort doing the exercises that you're saying. Like in my mind, that's an excellent indication for an injection because you're going, you know, I'm going to give them an injection, which will calm down the inflammation, allow them to do the exercises better, allow them to get a little rest at night, potentially take some of the uh, burden of like, the emotional aspect of uh, recovering from this pain problem. And so I think that can be very helpful. The flip side is that you don't want to do them too frequently. Um, injections last for a long time. There's a lot of studies that show increased complications or issues, even up to three months. You know, there's a recent rotator cuff uh, uh, surgery study where they showed that there were higher uh, retail rates, even up to three months after an injection. So it, it may be better not to get an injection if you end up in the surgery pathway. So that, that's one reason not to do it. Um, and and, and uh, I think if you space them out, they're probably fine, but not back to back. So I'll tell people like, hey, let's try one if it's the right indication. Give it plenty of time and make sure we're doing the rehab. I think injections in the long haul are like Band-Aids. They don't fix the problem. They just help with pain management. So fixing the problem is really therapy. So if someone comes in and they're like, yeah, I mean, the pain bothers me, but I can do the exercises. I can work through it. I always say, well, let's hold off and not do an injection then because that's, that might not, you know, help you really get to where you want to be. And the, and the last thing is that injections, the injections we do are corticosteroids. Those break down muscle tissue. They don't build up. They're not like anabolic steroids that build things. So anabolics are going to help you recover, but we don't really use those because, we, we probably just don't understand them enough yet. Um, but uh, the corticosteroids, they break down tissues. So you're kind of like, uh, you know, uh, fighting against yourself. If you're trying, you know, if you're, if you're getting an injection for pain, it might make it a little harder to build up muscle. So I think that's another counter argument for why not to do them. I try to be as natural as possible. Like, let's get your shoulder back in natural methods. But if it if you just can't, like if you're to that point that it's too sore, too painful to do that, you know, then then that in my mind is the time when I want to try an injection. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and to reiterate what you said that I think is so powerful is that you said when you're working with that person and you're doing that patient interview and you're finding out, hey, right now they can't do their exercise, their rehab. They're that inflamed. Prostaglandins are that high. They feel miserable that that, but they want to do the rehab. And they want to do that piece conservatively to do what they can do. 
that's when injection works really great. There's some good evidence published in the last several years about this exact topic. When do we use steroid? When do we not? And what was so interesting to me in reading some of those papers was that if the case, the first thing out the gate was giving them an injection for the shoulder pain before doing any reasoning to see if they're willing to do the rehab or not, mentally they almost think that I need an injection, it's the only thing that can help my pain. But if they already understand I need to do the rehab, I'm trying, I'm doing what I can, and I'm still miserable, they had way better outcomes. And I think that is so important, and a skilled clinician like yourself is gonna, in that moment, seem like that's that's a no-brainer, it's an easy switch, but we see that on the rehab side where they're like, oh, I already went there, they gave me an injection, and, and they're like, oh, I was good, but then two, three months later, it came back, and now I'm on injection four, and and, and the rehab side, they're just like, ah, those exercises, those won't ever help me, and it's like, oh, darn it. Like, that's hard because they've already now feel like they confirmed their own bias that injections is the only thing that ever helped them, and that is a way harder road, so I love exactly what you said. I think that is so important of a message uh, to share, and I can't wait to make that a snippet uh, to push that to the world because that was that was awesome yeah no it's it's uh i i um the motivation to do therapy if you get really good pain relief after an injection is low but you haven't fixed anything <laughs> so you you gotta you know i i always really push don't do the injection unless you can't do the therapy you know you can't do the exercise because of pain that's awesome. We had a bunch of questions come in about actually now when someone actually does need surgery. So if an individual does need surgery, Nate had asked, what is your opinion on the idea of prehab or uh, what he means by that is rehabilitation before getting the procedure versus waiting till just after the procedure. What are your thoughts from your side of things? So I think people absolutely need therapy before surgery because when these problems develop, you know, let's say it's a degenerative tear that it eventually ends up getting surgery. They, they do try everything, you know, and sometimes that happens. You know, I think most of the time, if you have a degenerative tear that just comes up, comes up randomly, we can get you better without it, but not a hundred percent of the time. So let's say you do, you have the tear, you get therapy, it's not getting better. You're still having a lot of pain. You get injections. It's still not getting better. Um, the, you know, the, the, uh, there's a lot of secondary issues that come up. Um, I would say that one of the really common ones is scapular dyskinesia. The, 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 the scapula sits on our chest and it's controlled completely by muscles. And so when your cuff hurts, what, what you try to do is you compensate and you might raise your arm up, but you raise it more with the scapula instead of using the rotator cuff like you should. So those are secondary problems that come up. And those secondary problems can be as big of a problem as the primary issue. So a lot of times I'll see somebody in clinic. I just saw, I mean, today, I see it almost every day in clinic, but I saw somebody today just to kind of speak of this. And I, I don't think, I think they have a rotator cuff problem, not a tear. Um, but ultimately they had pretty significant scapular dyskinesia. So all I did was immobilize the scapula. I pushed it up against the chest and I had them raise their arm up. And then I had them raise their arm up when I didn't stabilize the scapula. And, you know, you see their eyes like open up, like my pain went away. And the, I didn't say it. The patient was like, I have a lot more strength when my, when my, when you push on me right there. And, uh, and that didn't hurt. And so you realize like, Oh, the, the secondary issue is almost bigger problem than the primary issue. So if they don't fix the secondary issues, let's say you get, cuff surgery and you never fix the scapular dyskinesia problem, you're going to have an impingement issue immediately after surgery that's going to jeopardize that repair. So you've got to get everything else back in shape before you're a good candidate for surgery. And, and people that do preoperative rehab, I think they do significantly better after surgery because they've optimized all of the other muscle functions. Yeah, brother, I completely agree. The ones where we do prehab on them, we see that exact same thing. They're so much quicker to get that cuff to turn on. So we see that that shoulder blade locks down a heck of a lot better and that they start getting way better function quicker. Um, and there was actually a, a cool paper. I try not to get too nerdy with these, but when you bring up the fun topics, it gets really fun. But they were actually inducing scapular dyskinesis by fatiguing out the cuff. So they would take individuals, fatigue out the rotator cuff and watch it. They're gonna naturally do exactly what you just said because 
their cuff so fatigued or weak or painful that they're going to naturally have to do that compensation because how the heck else are they going to move their shoulder? And so I think those implications are super powerful in the rehab world too, because if you are over fatiguing their cuff and a repair, they're going to have to go to these bad habits. And now that just makes the world even harder. So I just think that is, um, that was awesome. That was fun. We should just <laughs> keep doing that. That's great. Um, Someone had asked, can you give a little bit more detail on what dyskinesia actually means? And I think that we we did a good definition of that by saying, hey, it's when that shoulder blade moves all around. Uh, but if you could speak to that just a little bit more to make sure that it was clear to the listener. So I think that the best example I would have is if you have somebody face away from you and they just slowly raise their arm up and down and they do it repeatedly, somebody with dyskinesia one, one shoulder blade will just stay kind of stuck to the chest and the other side will start winging. It will change positions. It will look awkward. And, it, and this is something that, you know, my 11 year old son could pick out like, Hey, what, what, one of these things is not like the other, which is it? It stands out. It's pretty obvious. And I like when I'm seeing patients in clinic, if they have somebody with them, I'll say, hey, what, what do you notice on their shoulders? Like, what's the difference? And they go, oh, that, that shoulder's sticking out. Like, it looks funny. So, so what's happening is the, the muscle coordination is not keeping the scapula in uh, the right position. And it's happening because you're having pain, let's say, around the cuff or in the shoulder, and you're trying to compensate for it and, to, and reduce that pain. But in doing so, you know, you, you, you kill the mechanics of how the shoulder's supposed to work. And, um, it's, it's just a muscle coordination thing. It's, it can get really complicated or it can get really simple. And the really simple way is just one of these things is not like the other, you know, it doesn't look right. And yeah. the complicated aspect is what you are really good at. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing which muscles to work on. I think that's great. And I think the other last tidbit there, because you brought it up a couple of times, but doing that scapular assistance test, that's w one of the number one ways to predict of how they're going to do a therapy. If that takes their pain away, we know that you basically just say that the weight of the arm, you just took the weight of that arm way down dramatically. And if that helped, then they're back to that analogy we used earlier there. They're lifting that one pound fine, lifting the five pound fine, but they can't do the 11 pounds. So we got to build them up that way. I think that was great. Um, the last little question I'll get before I'll, um, I'll let you go. Can you explain a little bit about when someone has um, a labrum tear? So a labrum tear is the other thing that we hear a lot about. And uh, can you just talk about the ones where they don't remember a trauma, but they, for whatever reason, got that MRI quite quickly and they had maybe a, a really strong MRI and you now see, you can see some labrum changes. And, you know, there are people that will even come into our clinic and say, oh, but I have this, this labrum tear. And then we, we test them and we, we couldn't tell that that's a thing at all. If we wouldn't have had the scan, the, the function was pretty dadgum good. But can you just talk about that when there's no trauma involved and you see a mild labrum tear? How, how does that get handled or how should that be thought of uh, to, to an individual that may be going through that? So th this is a chance for me to kind of step back and thank my mentors. I, I really had the opportunity to trade with some of the, the top shoulder surgeons in the country, which, which was very a very unique opportunity for me. Um, but but one of the sayings, so Dave Alchek, who I would say is probably the best shoulder surgeon in New York City and probably operates on more, you know, uh, elite athletes' shoulders than anybody else in the country. You know, he, he would always say, like, do not. Uh, do not MRI a pitcher's shoulder. And I'm going to apply this to everybody's. But the, the, the point is that when we do, you know, athletics, when we, whatever our unique thing is, and I like to, I really believe everybody's an athlete in what you like to do. Like we, we have, you know, some people are pitchers, some people are surgeons, some people, you know, are painters, some people, like everybody does their own thing. And, and they develop adaptive changes in their shoulder in order to do the things that they do repeatedly, especially repetitive tasks. So adaptive changes allow you more function and they may be totally normal. So if you MRI every pitcher's shoulder in Major League Baseball, they're all gonna have labral tears. Most of them are not gonna have shoulder problems or pain, like some of them will, but not all of them. And so you don't wanna MRI them because now they've been labeled, you know, they'll get their report that says you have a label tear and it jeopardizes their career because 
now, like, what if they get traded? Oh, but you got a labral tear. Well, I want that fixed before you come to my team. And then they get it fixed and they don't throw hard anymore. <laughs> and their stock is shot. Like, they're, they're, it really can damage their career. And so, Absolutely. you know, so it's, it's interesting in, um, with labral pathology, like on the, on the elite side, we try not to image them. But yet on the a- amateur side or on the everyday person, nor- the normal people, the, all of us, we, we end up giving, getting images on ourselves way more quickly and find these tears and then we freak out about it. And a lot of times the first thing that we're told when we say, oh, you got a label tear, you're probably going to, or you might need that fixed, or you're probably going to get that fixed, or that's probably what's causing your pain. Finally, we figured it out. When the reality is that might just be an adaptive change and your, your pain is from your rotator cuff. It's not even from the labrum. Your pain is from bursitis. It's not even from the labrum. So I think adaptive changes are normal. And when you get an MRI, like they're not going to say, hey, this is an adaptive change. They're going to say, we see a labral tear because that's, that's how that, you know, that's how they do it. That's how it works. Exactly. And I think that's what's so powerful to understand is that all the team aspects, there are times where we're going to have great medical radiologists that have been trained so well to be able to read that report for us. So we'll get that report quickly before we even get a chance to look at it or look at it with the patient. But the hardest part of that is if they get the report for some reason before we even get to talk to them about it, well, they're gonna define and write down everything depending on how they were trained as a radiologist. And a lot of those findings can be incidental and it takes a real skilled clinician or surgeon to be able to look at that and then say, okay, well, this is what it really tells us and clinically correlates our matters and this is what doesn't. And so hearing you say that, man, is just, um, it's, we're just on two different sides of the spectrum, but brother, we, we're saying the exact same thing. And that's what's so exciting. And it's always a pleasure to, to be able to work with you. Well, Jaron, I'm going to have one more sip of this lemon drop. And I hope you have one more sip of that bourbon left. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on, man. I can't wait to have you again if you'll have us. And uh, we have plenty of more topics we need to get into. And so if anybody has any questions in the comments, please let us know. Jump in there. Give us um, any recommendations. But I have a whole list of topics I think we should get through. Uh, I'd love to. Uh, It's been a pleasure being on the show. And uh, cheers. Cheers, brother.